<clears throat> Hello everyone, this is Ignacio Camarillo from Purdue University. I first want to say thank you very much for the opportunity to share some of our work. So my lab is interested in the link between uh, diet, obesity, and breast cancer incidence, progression, and drug resistance. And today I'm going to take a little bit of time to talk about the mechanisms of obesity and leptin in breast cancer. So breast cancer has recently been designated as the leading cause of cancer-related incidences you know, worldwide. So the World Health Organization has revealed that in 2020, there were 2.3 million women diagnosed with breast cancer and 685 deaths globally you know, as a result of breast cancer. So this, you know, is um, a very concerning, you know, uh, uh, statistic. And what's even more concerning is that this uh, breast cancer right, is, is anticipated to continue to be, you know, a, a substantial concern. So uh, more recent studies have shown that or have, um, have, have proposed that um, incidences and mortality of breast cancer are going to be increasing by as much as 50% over the next 20 years. So this really prompts us to increase our efforts, you know, to better understand this disease. So what we do know about the factors that influence breast cancer, you know, some of them are summarized here and they're grouped into uh, sort of genetic factors or factors that are more modifiable. Okay. Regarding the genetic factors, some you know, well-known um, genetic uh, mutations, especially those in the, the BRCA gene, right, are associated with increased breast cancer risk. Also, a woman's, uh, the number of cycles, that, uh, menstrual cycles that a woman uh, has during her life can also impact uh, breast cancer. So if a woman has her first cycle at an earlier age or a later menopause, then those uh, um, features have, are related, associated with increased breast cancer. Okay. Uh, taller women with higher levels of growth hormone have a higher incidence of breast cancer. Um, in addition to these factors, we know that when a woman has goes through a full-term pregnancy, right, uh, that can be associated with uh, risk factor for, for uh, breast cancer. Generally, it's been shown that women that go through a full-term pregnancy at a younger age compared to an older age, you know, up through the mid-30s, that uh, that's associated with protection against breast cancer, the younger age pregnancies. If a woman decides to take hormone replacement therapy during menopause, especially combinations of estrogen and progesterone, right, that is associated with increased breast cancer risk. Uh, probably the most recent identified risk factor for breast cancer is obesity. So uh, the, some of the original data that was associated with obesity and cancer is shown here. Uh, this shows that with a higher uh, body mass index, especially uh, above 25 or, or, or 30, which is you know, on the road to, you know, morbidly obese, that's as um, higher the BMI, the higher the risk for several types of cancer, including, you know, postmenopausal breast cancer, uh, as well as colorectal cancer, endometrial cancer, uh, esophageal cancer, and others. And so this, um, you know, sort of prompts us to better understand what this relationship is, especially the Michael Michael molecular mechanisms, sorry, of this connection between obesity and breast cancer, and knowing that this is a substantial uh, um, concern, right, in the U.S. especially, where 60% of the U.S. population is considered either overweight or obese. So here's a diagram of uh, the mammary gland or breast tissue, and there's different cell types that reside in it. So the pink, you know, cuboidal cells are the epithelial cells, and uh, these cells uh, undergo growth and development, right, under hormonal influences, right, and they reach their ultimate uh, function during lactation, right, after pregnancy during lactation, for by producing milk, right, and these cells are susceptible to transformation, you know, and growth and tumorigenesis through a variety of different insults. Okay? 
And the proper growth and development of these cells is dependent upon other cell types in the mammary gland, including immune cells uh, like macrophages or uh, fibroblast growth uh, or fibroblast um, cells, sorry, and also adipocytes. So during the in the non-pregnant breast, right, adipocytes actually are a predominant type of cell, you know, in the mammary gland. So as we can see here, there's a a fair amount of crosstalk between these different cell types and the mammary epithelial tissue. So these cell types can release, you know, steroids, growth factors, extracellular matrix proteins, which can impact normal mammary growth and development, and also uh, transformation and tumor progression. So our lab is basically interested in this relationship between adipocytes and epithelial cells and how adipocytes secrete different hormones, particularly the adipocyte hormone leptin, and how that impacts epithelial growth, development, transformation, and then tumor formation and progression. Another aspect of this relationship that we're very much interested in is not only does how does leptin impact changes going on within mammary cells, but how does leptin promote this the regulation of the release of different components from the mammary cells that can change, modulate, impact the microenvironment that can be important for, you know, transformation or progression of, you know, um, these epithelial cells into aggressive cancers. So regarding leptin, so leptin uh, is a peptide hormone primarily released from adipocytes and its levels in the circulation increase with increased obesity so the more adipocytes and the larger the adipocytes you know that the, the become then the more leptin is dumped into the circulation the, one of the first attributes or functions of leptin was <clears throat> connected to its ability to regulate appetite and body weight so essentially, leptin is released from adipocyte cells, acts on receptors in the brain to suppress, you know, ad uh, appetite. So in a way, leptin is a, a, a monitor of the energy storage within the body. Okay, and so one of the first studies that showed that leptin uh, was connected with mammary tumor formation was done by Bernard et al., which showed that. Uh, animals deficient, deficient in leptin signaling or resistant to mammary tumors. Other studies supported this idea and started showing that animals uh, deficient in leptin or uh, leptin receptors did not or substantially reduced um, risk for developing mammary tumors. So this connection between leptin and mammary tumor formation prompted you know, us to better to develop studies to better understand the mechanisms of leptin and its impact on a mammary epithelia and, you know, mammary tumors. So some of the goals in, in the studies that I'm going to describe here are uh, we wanted to better understand the relationship between uh, obesity, diet, and mammary tumor form formation, better understand the role of leptin in tumor growth, and we wanted to determine the uh, influence of obesity on the mammary tumor microenvironment. We hypothesized obesity would promote tumor incidence, growth, and tumor aggressiveness, uh, as it does in humans. Uh, uh, so, and we used an animal model for this. And then we hypothesized leptin promote, plays an important role in uh, mammary tumor growth and progression. Our aims for these studies were to use proteomic and genomic methods to identify molecules by which leptin influences tumor growth. And we wanted to evaluate the incidence, number, and aggressiveness of tumors in an animal model of obesity and breast cancer. And in this model, we wanted to use advanced imaging methods to gain novel insights into the impact of obesity on the tumor microenvironment. In this first set of in vitro studies, we wanted to identify leptin-regulated molecules in breast cancer cell growth. For these in vitro studies, we used a human breast cancer cell MCF7, which is estrogen receptor positive, and a low-grade uh, form of 
uh, representing the low-grade form of, the, of breast cancer. In previous studies, we showed that leptin can promote proliferation of these cells and uh, increased cell survival and uh, reduce apoptosis. Okay. So for these uh, studies, we wanted to really better understand how leptin is causing the changes in these cells, especially their ability to secrete proteins, which can be involved in uh, impacting tumor growth and uh, progression. So in these studies, we treated these cells with or without leptin. We isolated the media and then analyzed the proteins in the media through two methods. High abundance proteins were detected through coupling 2D gels with mass spec methods and low abundance proteins were uh, identified through uh, protein array techniques. So here we show uh, analysis of proteins via the 2D gel mass spec methods. So essentially the proteins that were isolated from cells that were treated without or with leptin were loaded onto these 2D gels and these proteins were separated by their pH from low to high and their molecular weight right in this vertical direction and what we see here is in the exposure to leptin caused a substantial difference in the pattern of proteins that were released that were released from these cells the same amount of protein was loaded on these uh, gels and we can see here that um, the proteins released uh, you know, from these cells in the absence of leptin were really, you know, um, um, low abundance and there were a large variety of different proteins that made them harder to detect. In the presence of leptin, there was a, a big increase in a handful of proteins that were detected using these methods. And some of these most uh, dramatically increased proteins uh, are shown here on this table and they included KF10, human protein KIAA, which is a collagen precursor, and previous studies shown that it was uh, involved with hyperproliferation of the mammary gland. They also, we also detected another extracellular matrix protein uh, unit, right, laminin alpha-2 chain, and we also detected chordactin isoform A, which is uh, an overexpressed protein in breast cancers and associated with cell adhesion. So to support these studies, um, we um, evaluated, quantified levels of different collagens, extracellular matrix rate collagen uh, in MCF7 cells in response to leptin. Okay, And this shows here, these panels show here the immunofluorescence studies that detected uh, collagen 4 in response to leptin in these cells. So here we show in this first panel that leptin caused a big increase in the number of cells, you know, uh, MC7 cells in response to leptin. Uh, leptin treatment uh, promoted uh, increased production, right, of collagen 4 and particularly, right, uh, around the circumference of these cells. Okay, and when you merge these cells, you can see you know, the, the, the extent of the increase of collagen 4 and its localization here around the cells. Okay. These two panels here support these immunofluorescence studies, and this western blot shows uh, that collagen 4 proteins were increased in response to leptin, and that collagen 4 mRNA was substantially increased by over 16-fold, right, in response to leptin. This was a real-time PCR. So, in addition to these, uh, uh, you know, the studies there, we also evaluated uh, secreted proteins in response to leptin using these uh, protein arrays. So, in these studies, the membrane that contained dozens of different antibodies on it were used. They were incubated with the uh, media isolated from cells that were uh, treated with leptin or not treated with leptin. And here we show the different uh, pattern of proteins that were detected in each of these samples. Okay? When we quantified these uh, proteins, we essentially saw that 
there was a dramatic changes in the levels of secreted distinct proteins in many of these proteins. The most dramatic changes we saw were in these here in the protein in the table shown below. So these proteins that were increased in response to leptin included fibroblast growth factor and a macrophage colony stimulated factor. FGF is a known factor involved in several different aspects of tumor growth and invasion. MCSF is a central um, molecule involved in the recruitment of macrophages to the tumor site. And we know that uh, the recruitment of immune cells to the tumor site is critical for the progression of tumors, or the, the progression to the more aggressive invasive type state. Leptin also causes substantial decrease in a couple of different growth factors, including TGF beta and IGF BP. So these factors are known to be inhibitors of the cell cycle and proliferation, uh, respectively. IGF BP inhibits is a regulator of insulin and IGF action. So in essence, leptin is suppressing factors that are inhibitors of proliferation. So in parallel to these studies, proteomic studies, we also uh, used a microarray analysis to identify differentially regulated genes in response to leptin in MCF7 cells. And this was done at six and 24 hours. And here we see the several different classes of genes that we identified. I'll just um, mention a couple uh, really quick here. So we saw that uh, leptin caused a substantial increase in MT3, which is known to uh, regulate cell proliferation. This happened very early on, okay? And it caused a decrease in uh, KI, KAI1, which is a metastasis suppressor. Again, leptin is suppressing factors that suppress, you know, apoptosis, and suppress tumor progression. Uh, along with, um, um, you know, these factors, leptin cause an increase in BCL2, again, which is an important factor in regulating, suppressing apoptosis. Uh, another big change that we saw, leptin cause a, a huge increase, eightfold increase in uh, CTGF, which stimulates several different extracellular matrix proteins. We also saw a substantial decrease in TGF beta, right, at the mRNA level. So collectively, these in vitro studies uh, show that leptin can impact epithelial and, and low-grade cancer cells through a number of different ways, right? The novel sort of insights that we uh, gained from these studies are shown here. Leptin binds to its receptor on these uh, tumor cells. It can stimulate proliferative pathways. It can also regulate and uh, suppress the release of inhibitors such as TGF beta and IGF BP while increasing the release of things that promote tumor proliferation and progression such as FGF, MCS, FF, or you know, extracellular matrix proteins, and we saw a huge abundance, you know, of these. Okay. So this establishes some insights into the mechanisms of how leptin can work. And in our next studies, we wanted to better understand what was happening in vivo and how these in vitro mechanisms, you know, uh, are related to what's going on in vivo. So for this, we develop uh, and characterize an animal model of diet-induced obesity. So we know that obesity in humans is a result of, you know, poor behavioral um, um, insights or poor behavioral, uh, uh, um, what it, excuse me, poor behavioral, uh, you know, status in humans. And so what this is really saying in this chart or this diagram is that humans that undergo, you know, exercise and uh, a healthy diet, you know, have a reduced number of adipocytes and the adipocytes are smaller. This results in lean tissues and a better uh, profile of comorbidity factors in their circulation. Right? Humans that are um, 
um, limited in their exercising and take on you know excessive caloric you know intake and a poor diet high in fat and simple sugars I have increased adipocyte numbers increased size of adipocytes and this is this leads to metabolic syndrome which is characterized by circulating elevated levels of leptin insulin triglycerides free fatty acids cholesterol and glucose so we wanted to develop a model of obesity and breast cancer that is reflective of what happens in humans. So knowing that obesity in humans is a result of poor behavioral choices and not, you know, a result of genetic uh, mutations in the leptin receptor. So leptin, you know, mutations in humans is and, and mutations in the receptor are actually quite rare. Okay. So, in describing the animal model that we used, again, we wanted to uh, use a model that is reflective of the different stages of tumor genesis or you know, breast cancer progression, especially the earlier stages and the earliest stage of cancer. So, this summarizes the earliest precancer stages, right, in humans, where you have a normal duct that starts to go, undergo increased proliferation or hyperplasia. Uh, this progresses to atypical ductal hyperplasia where cells are increasing in number in the duct and they start to lose their polarity. This crosses over into ductal carcinoma in situ, DCIS, where these cells multiply and then they fill the duct, but they're still maintained within the duct. In these initial precancer and early cancer stages, these type of tumors usually are estrogen receptor positive. When these uh, cancers become more aggressive, they lose their estrogen receptor status, and these cells start to be invasive, you know, break the barrier here of the duct, and then start to invade in the surrounding tissue and beyond. Okay. So we wanted to use a model that is reflective of these early stages of cancer. And then want, we wanted to push it to more aggressiveness in the context of obesity. So we chose this Sprague Dolly animal model, which is a, a well established uh, model that pre, uh, reliably produces low grade estrogen receptor positive tumors that can be classified as DCIS. So when these female animals are, the virgin animals are treated with carcinogen MNU you know, at around 50 days, they develop tumors, you know, very, very quickly. So we wanted to use this model, these rats, and develop an animal model of obesity that's reflective of what happens in humans. So we fed these animals either a balanced diet or a Western diet that was high in fat and high in simple sugars. Just like humans, a portion of these animals were resistant to the diet and remained lean, lean as the control animals, okay? And a portion of these animals became obese. And in these obese animals, they had a higher body weight, higher fat mass, uh, and elevated circulating comorbidity factors, elevated leptin, glucose, free fatty acids, and triglycerides. So using this model, we could test to determine the impact of diet and diet in the context of obesity on tumorigenesis. Okay. So we generated these three groups of animals, treated each, each group with carcinogen, and then evaluated primary tumor latency, incidence, and aggressiveness. And we, we evaluated the microenvironment through advanced imaging. Here's the first set of data, which shows the onset of tumors in these three different groups. So essentially, these this is the days after the carcinogen injection, and this scale represents animals, number of animals without tumors. So essentially what we see here is that the animals that were on the balanced diet, right, developed tumors later than animals that were on the Western diet. So animals that were on the Western diet, whether they were lean or they, or they were obese, they developed tumors sooner which is a very interesting, you know, uh, observation. When we evaluated 
the tumor histology, we showed that the obese animals that were on the Western diet right, had a, a greater number of tumor load, much higher overall numbers of tumors, and the percentage of tumors that were aggressive and invasive was much higher than the other two groups, 69%. In the lean animals that were on the Western diet or the rat chow diet, they had fewer tumors and the percentage of aggressive tumors was much lower. Here we see a histological depiction of the different types of images we saw. So this is the normal mammary gland for reference where we have ductal uh, epithelia and then predominantly fat tissue. In the low grade tumors, we see a higher an amount of epithelial cells, but they maintain their polarity, their ductal polarity. In the obese animals, we saw primarily uh, aggressive tumors that lost their polarity, they're abundantly you know, increased in proliferation, and they're invasive, they're invading the microenvironment, including you know, surrounding this muscle tissue. Okay. Another marker of aggressiveness that we used was the measurement of mRNA of estrogen receptor alpha levels. And here we show very clearly that in animals that were lean, they were either on the Western diet or the Ratchet diet, they had much higher levels of this standard marker of tumor aggressiveness, right, estrogen receptor alpha, compared to obese animals. So the tumors of obese animals had much lower levels of estrogen receptor, indicating increased aggressiveness of these tumors. In the final set of these experiments, we looked at or we evaluated the tumor microenvironment by simultaneously measuring different aspects of the microenvironment using uh, advanced imaging such as uh, coherent anti-Stokes Raman scattering, second harmonics generation, and two-photon excitation fluorescence. So we used this to evaluate normal mammary glands and mammary tumors in each of the groups. And here's just a reference to show our ability to detect things like, you know, collagen in the mammary gland, uh, vas uh, blood vessels, uh, immune cells, you know, adipocytes in red here. In mammary tumors, we see a predominant, uh, uh, you know, amount of collagen, and we're able to see some small dots which represent lipid accumulation in the mammary tumors. So in our data that we collected, again, we evaluated the normal mammary gland of each of our groups, a lean rat chow, lean western diet, and obese western animals, and then we evaluated the mammary tumors. Essentially, we saw that in the obese animals and in the lean animals, we saw a greater num uh, larger adipocytes, even though there were large adipocytes and more adipose tissue in the obese western animals. When we evaluated the tumor characteristics, we showed that in the obese tumors, we saw much higher levels of collagen, right, compared to the lean tumors from these other two groups. And this is another indicator of the aggressiveness of the tumors in these animals. Overall, we can say that from these in vivo studies, that the Western diet animals, uh, the mammary tumors appeared sooner and it had greater numbers of tumors in these, uh, in, in um, the obese animals. The tumors appeared sooner in the western diet animals, whether they were lean or obese, which was an interesting observation. Obese animals had greater numbers of tumors, predominantly invasive and reduced estrogen receptor status like compared to the other two groups. And the obese rats had higher amounts of collagen and incidentally, we also saw uh, a different, you know, uh, characteristic of collagen, right? You know, more uh, linear collagen than sigmoidal collagen, which is a, a, a three-dimensional feature, you know, showing the, again, a more invasiveness type of, of uh, extracellular matrix compared to low-grade tumors. So we also uh, saw increased aggressiveness in obese rats that was in accord with what we see with uh, obesity and breast cancer comorbidity observed in humans. Okay. So we can conclude that during obesity, leptin can play an uh, 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 important role potentially in contributing to breast cancer progression, you know, particularly through modulating the extracellular matrix. So we developed 
uh, an animal model of diet-induced obesity and a, br a breast cancer model that parallels what we see in humans. And this model paired with the advanced imaging methods is a really important system for better understanding the impact of obesity on breast cancer. Okay, and this will um, can provide us you know, novel insights in um, this relationship with obesity and tumor incidence, growth, and aggressiveness. Finally, I'd like to thank uh, my lab and my graduate students, especially Chuck Rare, and you know, my collaborators right, for, and funding sources for these studies. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to entertain them. Please feel free to contact me. Thank you for your attention.